my name is Louisa and if you're new to this channel then you might be interested in subscribing. I talk about both psychology and theology and how those two things often overlap. So if that's something that you're interested in, click on the subscribe button and don't forget to like, share and comment. And for those of you coming back, welcome back. So today I wanted to talk to you in one of the videos in this series that I'm making, which is all about relationships, in particular marriage. In this particular video, I wanted to talk about how long someone should date before they actually get married. Is there an actual formula? Well, yes and no. There's kind of a formula based on some research in psychology. So we're going to get into that. But before we do, let's talk about the fact that you do need to consult God about your relationships, because throughout the Bible, we see examples of where God actually tells people who to marry. This is something that he takes a keen personal interest in. As it says, he wants godly children. So it's not even necessarily about the two people who are getting married. It's about the people that they are going to produce. But also sometimes God has a particular purpose for putting two people together. And that can play a bigger part in your individual purposes. So when you get two people who are already serving God and they already have particular purposes, Sometimes God puts them together so that they can essentially be support for each other and help each other with the journey and with their mission through life. So sometimes God will actually give you specific instructions about who to marry, but that is not something that you should rely on because it kind of depends on whether or not he has a purpose for your marriage or whether it's simply someone to share your life's journey with. God is first and foremost a good father and like any good parent, he equips his children to make good rational decisions for themselves. Parents that are actually doing their job should be equipping their children to be adults and adults don't technically rely on their parents to make decisions for them. Their parents can give them their opinion, give them their guidance, give them their blessing, but they don't necessarily do the process of discernment for their children. So today we are going to look at the process of discernment, not so much the process of getting a supernatural sign that someone is intended for you, because that may happen, it may not happen. And I think that if you are waiting for a supernatural sign, that may or may not be a good idea for you. So today we're going to have a look at the work of Dr. John Van Epp. So he based his book on a whole bunch of psychology research and he came up with a model that seems to be a success for relationships, for long-term committed relationships. In Christianity, Commitment means marriage, but in terms of like worldly definitions of commitment, there's all different categories and it's a little bit vague. So I'm not quite sure how they quantify commitment outside of marriage, whether it's just longevity or if there's some other criteria for it, but it's not really clear. Perhaps commitment is getting a mortgage together or adopting a puppy. I don't know. But in the Christian context, we're going to be talking about commitment as being synonymous with marriage, because quite frankly, it's one of the best means that we have to ensure that you don't end up in one of those relationships. That's not really a relationship. It's more like a situationship. People theoretically should take marriage quite seriously. They should see it as a very binding commitment. It certainly has legal repercussions and divorce is not an easy process to go through. I can tell you that from experience. 
So the process of dating and the process of weeding out potential suitors or potential spouses, because this actually applies to both men and women. So if you're a man watching and you're looking for a wife, this will apply to you just as much as it does women who are looking for husbands. This model isn't really based on gender as such. That being said, there are certain differences between male and female hormones and there are certain things that, biologically speaking, women are trying to safeguard and men are trying to safeguard. So biologically speaking, men safeguard their resources in terms of raising offspring. Uh, being the provider is a traditional role and it doesn't necessarily apply anymore. I don't think you should fence yourself in with, you know, the husband has to be the one that has the biggest job or anything like that. My stepbrother is a stay at home dad and his wife is a radiologist, so they do okay. How you negotiate different things between yourselves is really a personal couple decision. But traditionally, from a biological point of view, men used to safeguard their resources. So when a woman gets pregnant, she is very reliant on her partner for bringing her food, keeping her safe, doing all of these important roles that essentially protect her life and protect the life of her unborn child. So a man had to know that his partner was faithful in order for him to feel like he was actually looking after his own child and not providing for someone else's child. Which is why traditionally men gatekeep relationships, they gatekeep commitment. Whereas for a woman, biologically speaking, the most costly thing that can happen to her is to get pregnant and then be abandoned and have to fend for herself, fend for the child, and essentially be in this incredibly vulnerable position. So biologically, she needed a man who was also prepared to commit to her. So he needed sexual exclusivity and she needed commitment and provision. So those things are still biologically hardwired into us. And it is essentially how most dynamics play out. And that's why men and women have very different hormonal responses to sex. The hormone oxytocin is known as the commitment hormone, or in other words, a bonding hormone. Women experience a dump of oxytocin when they are breastfeeding. So it's known as the hormone which bonds the mother to the child. And it also bonds the husband to the wife. But because men are testosterone dominant, in order for oxytocin to, act to actually rise in his system, testosterone needs to decline. For women, it's very different. Oxytocin will immediately kick in the moment that she has sex. Whereas for men, if oxytocin hasn't built over time towards a level of commitment, it will actually instantly drop out the moment he has sex. So men actually need to commit before they have sex, otherwise they will lose interest in that woman. And women need to have a committed partner before they have sex, otherwise they will be stuck, bonded to someone who doesn't want them. So not only do we have a tricky situation hormonally when it comes to pair bonding, we also have very tricky situations when you get physical with people too early because it clouds your judgment. There is such a thing as being love drunk. So getting physical with someone before you actually know that person is crazy. For another thing, it's also very dangerous because you could end up essentially very attached to someone who is extremely toxic. 
So interestingly enough, psychology today actually agrees with the Bible when it says that you should probably wait for commitment. Now, psychology doesn't like to define its terms too much. And so they don't say marriage, they just say commitment. But yeah, biology is rigged against us. Okay, so now that we have the basics of biology, let's have a look at Van Epp's diagram. This is Van Epp's relationship attachment model, which is comprised of five components, knowing, trusting, relying, commitment, and touch. And all of these things should be in various different proportions to each other when it comes to dating, before marriage. This is all based on years of peer-reviewed research and psychology studies. So the first thing that you should make sure that you have when you're dating someone is that you know them. Dating or even just being friends before you date is all about getting to know someone else's character, what they're like, what their actual path in life is going to be, very important things when it comes to compatibility. So you should know someone more than you trust them, and you should trust someone more than you actually rely on them, and you should be able to rely on someone more than you have actually committed to them, and you should be committed to someone more than you actually touch them. When we first start dating someone, this is roughly where all five of those levels sit. They sit almost near the bottom. We kind of have to take a little bit of a leap of faith in order to start dating someone, but it doesn't mean that we can trust them, rely on them, that we know anything about them, that we should be making any commitments to them, or that we should be allowing them to touch us. This is what the first few weeks of dating should look like the next few weeks, and the next few weeks, and the next few weeks. This is not how you date someone for a long-term relationship, and neither is this. We will talk about this very shortly, because I think this is one of the biggest issues with purity culture. So instead, this is what you're aiming for. You're aiming to know someone before you start trusting them, and you're aiming to know and trust someone before you start relying on them, and you're aiming to know, trust, and be able to rely on someone before you commit to them, and you're aiming to know, trust, be able to rely on someone, have a commitment to them before you start touching. And remember, a relationship involves two people, which means that the other person also needs to be behaving in a similar manner, and if they start pushing one of these boundaries before they've actually earned it, that is a massive red flag. So let's have a look at the most dominant aspect that we should be concentrating on when it comes to dating, which is knowing someone. Dr. Van Epp talks about three essential components which go into building what we know about a person, and that is talk, togetherness, and time. So this is where we get into the nitty gritty of how much time. And the research says that you need at least 90 days or three months of consistent talk togetherness in order to actually have some idea about who someone is. But that's assuming that the person is not trying to con you and that person is actually being honest about who they are. If someone is actually trying to deceive you, they can usually put on a pretty good act for about 90 days. And one of the problems with the human brain is that we have this tendency to fill in the gaps and make a lot of assumptions about other people based on who we ourselves are. In some respects, this is bad because if you're a decent person, you will assume that other people are basically decent. Whereas if you're a trash person, then you will kind of assume that other people are trash and that love is basically a game and you intend to win. So decent people can end up being blinded to someone else's faults because they assume and they fill in the gaps mentally to say that another person is essentially a good person. 
where this particular phenomenon actually works in your benefit is because the other person, if they are actually up to no good, if they're a bit of a devious individual, if they are someone who cheats, who lies, who does various other things, they will assume that you're doing the same thing. And so what you'll find is they will actually start accusing you of doing those things. So in that situation, rather than trying to prove your innocence and prove your worthiness in a relationship and placate that person, you actually need to recognize this as a sign of who they are. Whatever they are accusing you of being without any kind of evidence, that's probably what they're doing to you. So through the mechanisms of talk, togetherness and time, you eventually get to know a person and your knowledge of who a person is should outweigh all of the other aspects of the relationship. So you should know someone more than you actually trust them, rely on them, commit to them or have intimate contact with them. You need to know who you're dealing with and you need to know what their character is like. So rather than jumping into the deep end, over committing to someone or getting physically involved with them, you need to work on the knowledge aspect first. Knowledge will tell you whether you are compatible with someone for the long term or not, because you might have different values, you might have different goals in life. As it says in the Bible, can two walk together unless they be agreed? And the biblical outline of marriage is yoking. So essentially that's where two oxen have a wooden beam across the back of their neck and it ties them together so that they have to go in the same direction at the same time and pull the exact same weight together. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Marriage is equal teamwork. And that's why the Bible says not to be unequally yoked. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's just a spiritual thing. It might also mean lots of other aspects of life. So Van Epp's model is very much a proportional model. It's like the amount of knowledge you should have about someone is in proportion to how much you trust them, which is in proportion to how much you rely on them, which is in proportion to how much commitment you make, which is in proportion to how physically involved you are. When the proportions are all out of whack, when people jump the gun on various aspects, that's when you get seriously distorted relationships. One of the things that I see a lot in purity culture in Christianity is this thing where people are essentially just as worldly as anyone else and they are trying to manage lust and their solution for that is to overcommit to someone that they barely know. If we have a look at the model where it has essentially what people do with casual sex, it's not that much different from what purity culture does with marriage. This is essentially what happens with casual sex, and of course this is a rather extreme model. I wouldn't recommend this for anybody ever, but people actually do this. They don't know someone, they can't trust them, they can't rely on them, there is absolutely no commitment between themselves and this other person, and yet they are doing everything physically. It's extremely dangerous. There's no guarantee that they won't contract some kind of disease, that they cannot get pregnant, or that the person might not be completely insane and do terrible things to them. This model, which tends to happen a lot in purity culture, is not much better because not only do you not know the person, you don't know if you can trust them, you don't know if you can rely on them, but you're now in a position where you have to rely on them you have to trust them and you have over committed to someone that you don't know all for the sole purpose of being able to have sex except that casual sex is potentially less 
dangerous for you in the long term because you're not stuck with that person. You haven't entangled your finances and enmeshed your future with someone who might turn out to be abusive. The process of dating is all about discerning who a person is and having clarity of mind to actually assess that without letting lust cloud your judgment. If you're looking at someone because they look good and they have a certain career or whatever and you think that they fit into your fantasy of a future, then you are essentially wearing rose-tinted glasses. If you view a potential spouse through the lens of this projected fantasy, then you're not going to see the person themselves clearly. Instead, you need to remove yourself back a little bit. Don't invest a whole bunch of hopes and dreams in another individual. Maybe reset your expectations because in many respects, another person cannot necessarily fulfill all of the things that you wish to have happen in your life. A relationship is not an escape plan. That sort of mentality tends to put people in the position where they immediately trust and rely on someone that they don't know well enough and then they get into a commitment before they've actually discerned whether that person is legit or not. Even long distance dating is not really a great way to get to know someone because you kind of have to be physically in their presence in order to see how they relate and how they live and things like that. I think that's why in so many respects, a lot of Christians have a lot of success in marriage by actually going and serving in the mission field because it's essentially like, you know, the minimum 90 days of this pressure cooker situation where you are living with and working with a whole bunch of different people. You get to see them in high pressure situations and you can see how they live, how they respond to stress and how they respond to highly emotional situations. And it's actually a very good testing ground. If that's not an option, there are other ways to make discerning decisions about who you're dating. First of all, actually asking questions about what someone wants in life. Do they want to have kids? Are they able to have kids? Do they have specific roles in mind for yourself, for themselves? Some people are very traditional and some people are decidedly not. So you kind of need to find out whether that's something that might become a point of contention. So you should make the most of the time that you spend talking to someone, actually finding out whether you are able to talk to someone. <laughs> are you able to have a decent conversation? Are they someone who can engage you mentally? Are they interested in you as a person? Or are they interested in you in terms of what you can do for them? What purpose you might serve in their life? Because if that's their main aim, then they won't really see you as a human being and they won't relate to you as a human being. Does this person fall short of your expectations? Because we all have expectations when we start dating someone. It's just a case of whether the person that we're dating ends up disappointing our expectations or if they end up exceeding them. At times you might meet someone and you kind of assume that they're maybe a bit basic. <laughs> I know that I have perhaps unfairly judged people that I thought were just, you know, a very basic person. And then I find out that they're actually quite a complicated individual. They've been through some interesting stuff and their outlook on life actually is very impressive. If the reality about who someone is, is more impressive and more interesting than who you assumed they were, then that is a good sign. A future marriage will need to have two people who admire each other and respect each other. 
Another thing which might determine compatibility is things like personality. If one person is a social butterfly and they want to go out constantly and the other person is a real homebody, that might become an issue. At the same time, it might actually be a good thing. Sometimes our differences are helpful rather than a hindrance. So someone who is generally quite shy might benefit from having a partner who actually encourages them to get out and who can help them to break the ice with people. Your personalities don't have to be the same, but they do need to be complementary. And even though I said before that you do need to take lust out of the equation when it comes to discerning whether someone is a good partner for a lifelong future, at the same time you do need to be attracted to them. But again, sometimes people might exceed your expectations. You might think that someone is okay looking, maybe attractive enough to consider going out with them, but as you get to know them, they become more attractive because of who they are. And that's kind of ideal because we all know that looks fade with age and people go through all kinds of ups and downs physically. So if someone's soul, someone's spirit or someone's mind is one of the things that you find attractive, that's a good thing. One of the things that always irks me about purity culture is when they they quote 1 Corinthians where it says it's better to marry than to burn with passion. However, if you actually read that verse, it says if they cannot exercise self-control, then they should marry. <laughs> it's not really a recommendation that Paul is making, it's more like a concession. So when it comes to dating, you actually need to be prepared to exercise self-control, which means you need to have spent time working with the Holy Spirit and building your relationship with God. And you need to know that the other person that you're dealing with also has self-control because self-control is a fruit of the spirit. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Someone who lacks self-control will either try to rush marriage or they will try to rush physical intimacy. Because unfortunately, they know themselves well enough that they cannot delay gratification. Being able to delay gratification means that you're in a position where you can make rational decisions for yourself and actually spend that time getting to know a person rather than trying to get with another person. So if you're dating someone who has that level of emotional maturity, it means they won't constantly be attempting to push past those boundaries. They won't be trying to rush things and they will be very cautious about you doing it. They're actually interested in their own well-being, and that is a good thing. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We can see here in Galatians a list of character traits which kind of mark a person that you should avoid. And while most people are not into sorcery and murder, there's a whole bunch of other character traits that you can look out for. Things like jealousy and being a bit crude enjoying too much alcohol, partying too much, being incredibly selfish, having a real bad temper, just someone who dislikes people for no reason. If you see any of these particular character traits, run a mile. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The Apostle Paul is making the point here that if you are actually in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and you are spending a lot of time with God, then you're not ruled by your passions. It's not really something that you have to struggle with that much. People who are struggling with lust and who are struggling with other forms of emotional dysregulation, as listed in the fruits of the flesh, which is basically what that is, it's someone who cannot manage their own emotional state and they just freak out on other people because they seem to think that other people should be able to regulate their emotions for them instead of doing it themselves. One of the fruits of the Spirit is peace, and that means that someone who is actually walking with God and listening to God properly, they're not someone who is constantly up and down. They're someone who is very stable and very easy to be around. They don't have a lot of neediness that they're trying to force onto other people. They're not trying to get anything out of you. They're already emotionally fulfilled from within. And when it comes to dating, not only do you need to be looking for a person who has these particular qualities, but you need to be this person that has these particular qualities. Otherwise, you're not suitable. The peace of God surpasses understanding. Sometimes it's not necessarily anything that you can put your finger on, but you just have a sense of peace about being around someone. They don't make you anxious. A lot of people associate the sensation of butterflies with romance. Butterflies is actually a symptom of anxiety. And if someone that you're dating is inconsistent or unreliable, if they are giving you reasons to doubt their sincerity, then you will have physical manifestations of anxiety. However, if that person does not cause you sleepless nights, whether you are around them or whether they are somewhere else, if you find that you are able to just trust that they are doing what they say they're doing, that they are who they say they are, then that's a good sign. And the last thing that we need to talk about is whether or not you should be dating in church. And I think it varies. I actually am not hugely in favor of dating within your own church, simply because, I don't know, I, I feel like it gets weird. But at the same time, it gives you more opportunity to observe someone as a friend before you decide that they might be someone you could date. So in that situation, your knowledge of the person is already established. One of the things that I have learned about going to church is that there are plenty of goats in the congregation and there are plenty of sheep that are lost. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that not everyone that you meet in church is actually going to be someone who is walking with God. Sometimes people go to church because they want to be seen as good people. Sometimes people go to church because they're trying to find a spouse. It's not because they're actually interested in getting to know God. Sometimes people use Christianity as a bit of a front. They think that if they are seen as a Christian, then it means that no one can question them. No one can tell them that they're not doing the right thing. And by the same token, meeting someone outside of church doesn't mean that they are the wrong fit for your life. Unfortunately, when it comes to questions like that, only time really can tell you anything. And of course, don't forget to consult God. Pray about it. See what the Spirit says. Sometimes God will give you definite answers and sometimes he just trusts that you are growing up, that you are turning into an adult and that you are capable of making your own decisions. 
So how much time should you spend dating? Well, I can't really give you the answer, but probably at least three months, if not a year. If someone is in a rush to get married, I would question why, why they feel the need to put a lot of time pressure on something that is so significantly life altering. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Let me know in the comments if you have your own advice to dispense about this particular field. No doubt there is a lot that I did not cover in this particular video. Don't forget to subscribe, take care, and I will see you next time. Bye.